This is like one of the earliest scary movies I've ever seen. This is honestly one of the movies that got me into horror. I feel like this is a movie that got a lot of people into horror. This is Scream 1996 Kill Count. Recount. Oh. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and I- Oh man, I think my earbud is busted. It, my, my earbud is still like, my earbuds are peaking, and it's like cracking. That is busting. I am so mf and excited, y'all, because we are once again looking at Scream 1996, which competes with The Thing as my all-time favorite horror movie. I can't Ooh, say enough solid. about how much Scream has influenced me. I remember running scared from the opening scene as a 7 or 8 year old, True. and being proud of myself when I overcame that fear just a couple <laughs> years later. I watched the True. first three installments religiously during my first horror movie obsession, back when I learned HTML just to code my own website. While I didn't catch Scream <laughs> 4 when it first came out, it was filmed in my college town of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And of course, I had a freaking cameo in Scream 5. The Dude, that was thing crazy. I was at the movies and I noticed that. That was crazy. That was really cool. Man, Shake built a horror channel and got to be on there as like a fake horror channel. That's pretty cool. It's almost like he had his own stab franchise within the universe. That is pretty sick, man. That's sick. And he's been watching since he was like seven or eight. That's fucking sick. That's really cool. Chelsea and I have ever done besides get married. This franchise means the world to me and these kill counts will not be True. unbiased. But honestly, no review is. I'm just being upfront about how important this series and especially this first film is to me. I mean, I wrote about it in a published book. But Scream isn't just important to me, it's important to the horror genre overall. I'd argue True. it's one of the five most influential horror films ever made. It kicked off a second wave of slashers, the subgenre so integral to horror people often think they're one and the same. Slashers were made huge by Halloween and Friday the 13th and ruled the genre in the early 80s. But by the mid-1990s, they were a joke of their former selves, and the <laughs> horror genre had largely <laughs> the disappeared from the zeitgeist. That's not to say there weren't good horror flicks still coming out. There were, but to the general audience, horror films were just stereotypes. They were a punchline. Scream came in and acknowledged that the genre was full of tropes, but not in a jokey way like Jason Lives had done a decade prior. Instead, Scream kept the stakes high and the horror grounded. The characters talked about the same horror movies the audience had seen in real life. It might be hard to understand now, when every movie is filled with references, but back then, it was unusual for characters to show like the, the specificity of, of pop culture knowledge. It wasn't every day you were hearing references to The Howling. What's that werewolf movie with E.T.'s mom in it? The Howling. The Whip Smart script was written by Kevin Williamson, whose work perfectly captured the spirit of teenagers in the 90s. After Scream, Williamson would create Dawson's Creek and write more horror films that encapsulated the era. Finding a director proved a oh, bit faculty. of a challenge, though, with George Romero and huh. Sam Raimi both passing on the script. Wes Craven also turned it down at first, but changed his mind after hearing Drew Barrymore was attached, and after a young fan at a convention had told him his movies had gotten too soft. Craven didn't start directing until he was in his 30s when he made Last House on the Left, a zero-budget rape revenge film. He'd go on to make a few more horror flicks before creating A Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984. That gave the Ooh, world classic. Freddy Krueger the biggest horror icon of the 80s. But I guess that wasn't enough for old Wes, since he made another monster hit with Scream a dozen years later. Wes would stick with the series for the rest of his life, this movie Scream is... 4 his last directorial This episode. movie still never gets old. I, every time I watch this movie, it feels feels like the first time I watched this movie. Like it feels so good. The, like the the references, the acting, the I don't know, just everything feels so good to me still. But it may be my my nostalgia goggles too heavy. But every time I watch this, it, it always gives me gives me pretty happy. Also, James has really maybe two best picks I've ever heard in my life for horror movie franchise. Uh, favorites man said his favorites are scream and the thing those are fucking solid the thing is absolutely goaded as well before he passed away in 2015. Thanks in large part to his efforts, Scream is one of the strongest horror franchises through and through. Every installment gives a sort true. of state of the genre, discussing and reflecting yeah, on horror. It's true. Uh, I really struggle to watch the second and the third one, but they do have their all, they all have, they have like a, when they came out, they had quite impact 
first tendencies at any given time. The first dissects slashers. They really the live with their time, the you know? of a sequel. And the third caps off the original trilogy by going full-blown Hollywood. A decade later, Scream 4 came out, guns a blazing at torture porn and the proliferation of remakes. Another decade would pass before the fifth film tackled so-called elevated horror and more pointedly, the more recent requel phenomenon. Aside from the first film, no Scream is perfect, but no Scream is bad either. It's great. As for the original, it's one of those movies where everything just well, came together. Uh, he said no scream is bad. Oh man, I really struggle to watch the one where the voice changer, the voice changer where it like changes to Cindy's mom and shit, that shit kind of busted my brain up as a kid. I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember like as a kid, I was just like, I don't I don't really care for this. <laughs> it's got a hell of a it cast, it. an engaging whodunit mystery, and fucking Ghostface, man. Everybody knows Ghostface and his voice. Hello, Sydney. The first three screams were released between 1996 and 2000, and were then directly parodied by Scary Movie hmm. later that hmm. year. In other words, Scream was the horror subgenre of the late 90s. I used to take that for granted, since I was a kid at the time. But looking back, it's hard not to appreciate its impact. Scream's funny, it's scary, and it was a massive success. And it all started with a phone call. Oh, hey, hmm. speak of the devil. Hello? Hello, Jamathy. I want to play a game. Who is this? You should worry less about that and more about keeping your precious count filmable. Oh my god. What do you want? It's simple, Mr. Counter. You get all these sponsorships. Now it's time to prove you know what you're talking about. Answer three questions uh -oh. about today's sponsor, Raycon, and the Kill Count script can survive. Is that all? Let's do this. Stream if you say so. How much battery life oh, do you bet. get on one charge? Huh. That was weird. Child's play. Eight hours of playtime and 32 hours in the battery case. Don't get cocky. That's just a warm-up. First real question. How many colors do Raycon earbuds come in? Okay. Okay. Mine are flare red. And then there's my, carbon black, my, rose gold, uh, frost shame, white, dude? and electric blue. The stream shade died. Correct. But we Next. reconnected in like two seconds. How many five-star reviews does Raycon okay. have? I mean, that would be 50,000. I mean, is this the best you've got? I'm almost embarrassed for you. Fine. You want a challenge? What are the three Raycon sound profiles? <sighs> okay. That would be, um, pure sound, ideal for podcasts and audiobooks. Uh, balanced sound, ideal for music like jazz, pop, and rock. And, oh, uh, bass sound, ideal for music like hip-hop and EDM. Boom! Cough up the script, bitch! Damn it! Hm? How do you know so much? Because I love my Raycons, bro. I use them all the time. From when I'm working to when I'm working out. And they fit in my ear a lot better than I so. fit through doggy doors. Ugh, fine. Hm? Check out Raycons for yourself mm -hmm. and get 15% off your purchase at the link in the description okay. or go to buyraycon.com okay, slash dead meat. Now let's sit back and take a trip to NorCal in the 90s and find out how many kills there were in Scream. Oh, that sponsorship transition was so clean I forgot to skip. The movie begins with <laughs> That was crazy. Call. Oh man, someone dialed title card! Woodsboro High School student Casey Becker answers the phone to a velvety sexy voice. She says the caller has the wrong number, but he calls back again anyway. They wind up talking about Jiffy Pop, and then about scary movies. You like scary movies? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite scary movie? They this name one. drop Halloween and Wes Craven's Bro, own baby. A nice actually, I think it probably is this one. It's so hard to tell what my scary, like my favorite scary movie is. But Scream is always in the running for it. Scream is always close by. Also, another one that is pretty, like, this one's, like, just a personal favorite. It also has uh, Matthew Lillard in it. It's fucking, uh, uh, 13 Ghosts. It's not perfect. It's a very 2000s movie. It's, it's, it's quite something, but that's another movie that I quite enjoyed as a kid. Ooh, and uh, another quite 2000s movie, House on Haunted Hill. Those those are some absolute classic gems of mine. I like those. I don't know if they're my favorites. They Oh, man, they'd be close. Like, absolute nostalgia-based picks. Those are pretty up there. But Scream is definitely, like, one that I can say that I know people can get behind. That This is, like, one of the best scary movies ever, ever made. The Thing also, that is such a good shout. The Thing is fucking solid. Nightmare on Elm Street. I like that movie. It 
was scary. Wow, well, the first one was, but the rest suck. Oh, come on, Wes. Even New Nightmare? I did not write that line. Oh, fair enough. I mean, you <laughs> can't knock New Nightmare. It was Craven's testing ground for Meta Horror, released two years prior to Scream. It featured the actors and Craven playing real versions oh, yeah, of themselves. Oh, that was pretty fun. While an evil entity takes on Freddy Krueger's not appearance amazing. and tries to infiltrate the real world. Not 10 out of 10, but it's Wes Craven's New fun. Nightmare is a great movie, but it didn't resonate with audiences the way Scream did. I think the difference is the comedy in Kevin Williamson's script. New Nightmare is way drier and takes itself more seriously. Of course, despite its humor, Scream keeps scares as its priority. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. Fucking chills. This whole opening scene, mm -hmm. one of the best in horror history, is an homage to the opening scene of When a Stranger Calls. Scream's references to other horror movies are way too vast to mention in a kill count. I know I've said this before, but I do hope to make a separate video detailing them sometime. And if I don't, well, I'm sorry, okay? Before you can mm -hmm. pull a magnum and say, Pop, okay. pop! The caller's voice changes from sexy to scary. You hang up on me again, I'll gut you like a fish, understand? This threat of home invasion gets Casey jumping scared, and she reaches like a fever a pitch when she sees her boyfriend Steve Orth tied up outside. The caller tells her she can try to save his life while creating a catchphrase for a puppet. I wanna play a game. The game hmm. is Ghostface's Horror Trivia Night. Casey correctly names Michael Myers as the killer in Halloween, but fumbles the ball when it comes to Friday the 13th. Jason! As any pedantic, horror-loving kid knew to annoy their friends with, like me, Pamela Voorhees was the killer in Friday the 13th. Adult Jason showed up in the sequel, and don't even get me started about the hockey mask. Because Casey got it wrong, Steve loses his life. He gets stabbed to death in the dark. The lighting and editing is a little cheesy, but it is a solid evisceration in the end, oh, especially in the showing. unrated version. <laughs> Them guts be schlapping. Effects for Scream were done by the- I always forget like how gory the start of this movie is. It is kind of crazy like how that- that scene starts, like the man in the chair, that shit started off kind of crazy. A ubiquitous K&B effects group. For Steve's death, they made a chair with no back so actor Kevin Patrick Walls could kneel behind it, with his upper half sticking out over a fake abdomen. The belly was filled with rubber, latex, gelatin, and fake blood that then fell to the ground, something the MPAA was not a fan of, which is why it's cut in the R-rated version. With a chair through Casey's window, we're off to the races. There's no place to hide, but Casey arms herself with a knife and even uses the phone as a weapon when she needs to. Eventually, though, while going the distance, Casey's caught by Ghostface. Probably shouldn't have started running in slow motion, Case. That was dumb. <laughs> the violence here is much more realistic than a lot of slashers, and even more impactful is the emotional moment as Casey tries to call out for her parents. They end up hearing her through the phone as she's stabbed to death by Ghostface. They helplessly listen as their teenage daughter takes her final breath. Even worse is when they come outside. It is not a pretty sight. Casey's death was done in a similar way to Steve's, combining Barrymore and a fake corpse, but this time they made a full body dummy since it had to be hanging from a tree. The death of Drew Barrymore's character was a huge twist for the theater-going audience. The movie had marketed the shit out of her involvement, so it became a surprise and also a reference to Janet Lee in Psycho, who was billed as the star but died 47 minutes in. Drew had her beat by 34. Interestingly, it was Barrymore's idea to take the role of the cold open victim. She was originally cast as Sidney Prescott, the actual final girl, but changed her mind about starring in the film only six weeks before production began. I'm not sure why. Maybe Maybe she only wanted to work the five days it took them to shoot the opening, which took place in April 1996 at the very start of production. Taking over for her Looks was like the 22-year-old Nev Campbell, who had been in The Craft and two seasons of Party of Five. Campbell's acting is the bedrock of Scream's success. Sydney Prescott is my favorite final girl of all damn time, even if her taste in dudes is greasy-haired window climbers like Billy Loomis. Fair Sid's choice. boyfriend is played by Skeet Ulrich, whose intensity is only matched by his good looks. He's well known now among a certain audience as Jughead's dad in Riverdale. Billy desperately wants to get into Sydney's pants, but she hasn't been interested in intimate affairs this past year. Sorry about your dry dick, Bill, but try to have some understanding. Sid's still mourning her mom. Only a year ago, Maureen Prescott, wife and mother, was found raped and murdered not far from this peaceful town square. That human highlighter is Gail Weathers, loudest clown at the media circus that descends on Woodsboro High. Media criticism is a big part of the Scream films. Then 30-year-old Kevin Williamson was inspired to write Scream, originally entitled Scary Movie, while house-sitting by himself one weekend. He watched oh, a sensationalized yeah. news report about the 1990 Florida oh, serial yeah. killer deemed- And then the, the people who made Scary Movie basically just just took that name, right? I forgot about that. They wanted to name it Scary Movie and then 
the parody guys just took it. They're like, yeah, solid. <laughs> the Gainesville Ripper. He was so freaked out, he called a friend for comfort, and they talked about their favorite scary movies. Williamson's script was immediately popular, and a bidding war broke out between production companies. It was ultimately purchased by Dimension Films, which, along with its kids. parent company, Miramax, was founded by the Weinstein company. brothers, Harvey and Bob. Bob specifically made some major decisions for this film, like releasing it in December and changing its name from Scary Movie to Scream, inspired by the Michael and Janet Jackson duet of the same name. I fucking hate that these fucks are part of this movie's DNA. In my research, I kept having to see the same picture of that nasty ogre and his fuckhead brother. It was gross. <laughs> Sunny's tragic Jeez. recent past earns her sympathy Damn. from Principal Fonzie and the Woodsboro PD. It's doesn't headed sound, by Sheriff Burke, played doesn't by sound Joseph like Witt, great. who also played a cop in Nightmare on Elm Street. Woodsboro's deputy, Dwight Dewey Riley, is extra caring towards Sydney. That's because he's the older brother of her best friend Tatum, played by Rose McGowan. Sid and Tatum Tots hang out with the rest of the gang at the Friends Ooh, Mountain, grapes. which includes Grease Bucket Billy, his or Tatum's boyfriend Stu Mocker, and Randy Meeks, oh, the geeky fifth. Grapes. Man, when I was sick, I was munching grapes. Grapes sound so good. I, I forgot how, how good grapes were until I got sick a couple days ago. I should like demolished a whole bag. Wheel of the group who makes movie references. Shit tasted better than like any sour candy I've had. It tasted straight like a like a, a super sour candy. It was so yummy. This and talks in silly voices. Did you really put her liver in the mailbox? Because I heard that they found her liver in the mailbox. Not to be outdone by Jamie Kennedy, Matthew Lillard makes sure to choose some scenery himself. Never alone. Never alone. <laughs> <laughs> Ow, liver, liver, liver. It was a joke. And he will choose so much more. I look back at that performance, I'm like, what was he letting me do? <laughs> Sydney gets back home, which is empty for the weekend. Earlier, her dad told her he I'm was going out of town man. for a convention. Wonder if it's the same what one where Peltzer got stuck at. Sid's house, like Casey's, is huge and empty, so she probably shouldn't be there all alone. Not with you-know-who calling around. Hello, Sydney. The iconic voice on the phone was provided by Roger L. Jackson, who would later go on to voice Mojo <laughs> Jojo in the Mojo Powerpuff Jojo. Films. Craven never let the other no, actors <laughs> Mojo Jojo. give a scary stranger voice while they yeah, filmed the their scream scenes. Guy. When I'm working, I have a monitor there uh, so I can see through crazy. the camera's POV, though they can't see me, of course. The caller once again plugs my interview show when he asks Sydney, what's your favorite scary movie? In response, Sydney talks shit about the genre. They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she Ooh, should be going out the front. Oh shit, I just thought, oh, he asked that question and I thought of a movie. Uh, Cabin in the, wait, is it Cabin in the Woods? Cabin, is that what they call it? It's the one, it's the one where basically it's a scary movie that could, like, create the rest of scary movies. That movie is so fucking good. I have not seen that in a minute, but damn, that's a good ass movie. I just thought of that. Door, it's insulting. Her shallow judgment of horror is met with the caller breaking out his scary voice. Do you want to die, Sydney? Your mother sure didn't. Ghostface appears from inside her house and attacks Nev Campbell's stunt double. They talk joke, but she fends him off with a kick that sends him flying. With the front door locked, she's forced to be a stereotype, but keeps the ghost-faced killer out of her bedroom long enough for her, like, 14 4K internet to connect her to the police. A Billy boy suddenly pops in through the window, hugs Sid, <laughs> and drops his cellular tele- Oh, <laughs> uh, for some reason, I thought it was gonna be the message that was set in a scary movie to the police. A Billy boy suddenly pops in through the window, <laughs> hugs Sid, and drops his cellular we'll telephone. We'll be right there. Why, I hear we'll only be there witches right have away. those devices. Witch! 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 <laughs> ah, ghost! Damn it, Dewey. Why would you hold it like that? Billy is arrested despite his claims of innocence, and Tatum rolls up in her toy car to be there for her best friend. I love Dewey as this boyish Barney Fife who reverts to being a kid when he learns that Sydney's staying overnight with them. Does mom know? Yes, doofus. He's such a mm. funny leading male character. God damn it, Dewey. Well, what did Mama tell you? When I wear this badge, you treat me like a man of the law. Billy and his werewolf-looking dad maintain his innocence, but Sydney don't know what to think about her boyfriend. She definitely know what to think about Gail Weathers, though, who's slinking around the station looking for a scoop. Gail's been writing a book about the murder of Sydney's mom, but Sid didn't exactly put in a pre-order. I'll send you a copy. Oh. If that happened today, I bet someone would make like an auto-tune version that went viral. I'll send you a copy. Mm. Bam! Bitch went down. I'll 
Send you a copy. Bam! Shoot, that shit would get super memed. Bitch. Super, super, super bitch. Bam! Bitch went down. Sydney mega hates meme. Gail because her book is trying to exonerate Cotton Weary, the man arrested for murdering Sydney's mother a year ago. Gail thinks Cotton is innocent, and if these latest killings are connected, maybe she could prove it. If I'm right about this, I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? Hit you in the face with book sales. She approaches the case through the proudly stated 25-year-old Deputy Dewey. It doesn't take long for her to start whittling her way into his naive heart. Gal and Dewey's relationship is so fun to watch throughout the series, especially since it led to a real-life romance like and actually marriage married. between David True, Arquette and Courtney Cox. Crazy. And it all starts here, with this well-written and well-acted conversation. In a demographic study, I proved to be most popular amongst males 11 to 24. I guess I just missed you. I'm 25. I was 24 for a whole year. David Arquette is absolutely hilarious in this role. Dewey's my favorite <laughs> sure. man, eating his little ice cream cone while discussing suspects. He even kind of misses putting his sunglasses on. God, he's the best. <laughs> Dewey was originally written as a more muscly hunk, but after being cast as one of the high schoolers, David Arquette requested he play the deputy instead, partly because it meant he'd get to kiss Courtney Cox. Aside from possibly Drew Barrymore, the 31-year-old Cox was the most well-known of the cast, being two seasons oh, yeah, deep into friends. Friend. She had to lobby hard to get the role of Gail Weathers, since at first Craven didn't think she could be bitchy enough. Billy is released since his cell phone records are clean, but he's still guilty of being an asshole about Sydney's mom's death. No, it's been a year. Tomorrow. One year tomorrow. I know what, I think it's time you got over that. I mean, when my mom left my dad, I accepted it. It's the way it is. Damn, no chill factor at all to this guy. Stupid. The rest of the student body's just as bad, flapping their little ghost arms around with Christmas glee. After overhearing some shit talk in the shit closet, Maybe she's a slut, just like her mother. Sydney gets attacked, but she escapes pretty easily. Some people think this bathroom <laughs> attack wasn't from a real ghost face, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. Sure as clumsy as they usually are. In any case, <laughs> it gets school canceled for the day, and Stu immediately around. declares he's having a party at his farmhouse. He'll carry all the women there! Principal Hembry's not invited, but he'd be too busy anyway. Fonz in his hair in the mirror and pointing out Wes Craven's cameo that references his earlier horror hit. Damn little shits. Would you call me? Huh? Hmm? Not your friend. Oh, Wes. I always forget about that. Not sure why you're falling down while yeah, Wes this, chilling. Henry gets Freddy. killed in his <laughs> office by a ghost face who was staying late after school. Wonder what club Such he was a nice little Probably hidden theater. Easter egg. How else would he get that sparkly ass robe? Ghostface's costume is iconic, of course, but they oh, had a hard time figuring sure. out what he should look like. The script simply said a ghostly white mask. Howard Berger of KB sketched a bunch of initial ideas, but they were way too grotesque and goblin think, to be taken. I think surprisingly, Ghostface is like. Uh the the costume that scared me the most in real life because i remember distinctly when i was a kid there was like uh like a trick-or-treat event at the college close to my house and we went in the year i went to that festival there was just nothing but bloody ghost face masks and my brain just thought it was real i thought everyone was out to get me I thought it was done though. <laughs> that shit was spooky. I don't think I've ever gotten more scared besides like animatronic shit used to scare me when I was a kid. But when it comes to like like marketed scary people, I never really got scared of like the Jason, the Voorhees. Michael Myers actually used to scare the fuck out of me. Some sometimes people would like post up in the Michael Myers mask and just stand still, and that shit used to spook me as a kid. Um, but I think Ghostface overall, like, that year, I, I remember that year so distinctly in my brain of Halloween. I just remember seeing fucking blood up Ghostface, literally every part of the college, everywhere I look, motherfuckers were straight bleeding at the face. It was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it was, I did not like that. Seriously. Luck came upon production while location scouting at the house where they shot Hitchcock's shadow of And a there were so many ghost faces that it just felt like I was in a movie and they were out to get me. Like, it was, I, it was so bad. Out. The perfect mask was found in a bedroom by producer Marianne Madalena, Wes Craven's longtime producing partner, who was born in Lansing and went to MSU. Uh, go green? Just this once. At first, since they oh, didn't great. own the copyright for the mask, K&B tried to sculpt their own imitation. Production began with this version, which can be 
seen in many shots of the opening and every scene with Principal Henry, since Henry Winkler shot all of his stuff in one day right after they finished the opener. The KNB mask has squintier eyes and a smaller mouth, which is thinner at the bottom, thanks to Scream Trilogy for that info. Craven still preferred the original mask they found in that house though, and eventually they tracked down the makers. Fun World, a small New England company who agreed to let them use it as long as they were always given credit. Being uh, just a simple country boy that I am, cool. uh, I said okay, I just want that's to fine, just be sure that you, in the credits, say Ghostface, courtesy of Fun World Easter Unlimited, our parent company and send a hundred dollars. Fun World masks were used bucks. for the rest of the production, and are even in the opening scene thanks to some reshot inserts. Everyone in Woodsboro has their own theories about who the killer is behind that mask. Horror expert Randy thinks that Billy's a guilty boy. Stu thinks it's Sydney's still missing father. Basically, everybody's a suspect! <laughs> Billy lets Randy know he doesn't appreciate the accusation. Uh, the Stu lets Randy know he does appreciate his earlobe. The town closes for curfew as Red Right Hand plays, the kick-ass Dark Cowboy song by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds that was already used in an earlier montage. It would basically become Scream's unofficial theme song, appearing in all of the films but the fourth one. It's also used as the theme to Peaky Blinders, but it'll always be the Scream song to me. As for Woodsboro, wait. it's played by the city of Santa Rosa. Wait, they use the red- wait. They use the Red Hand song in, uh, in Scream? Is that what he's talking about? He's talking about the gong, right? The gong from Peaky Blinders? The Red Hand? Is that what he's talking about? This song. Dude, this is a good ass song. Bro, you know shit's going down when this comes on. It's the take one to the edge. Where? What part? Oh wait, it's here? Millennium. Actually. Ooh, hey, my man. Are you telling me that's not a killer? Oh. <laughs> Damn. What the fuck? That's crazy. Yeah, what a song though. That is a, that's a good song. Oh damn, it's also in uh Scream 5. Oh wait, I remember it being in Scream 5. Yeah. Oh. oh shit. I remember now. This is like the moment in the trailer that they showed off too. And where Red Hand should have been in Scream 4. Damn, I never realized that. And what a song choice. That's a good song. Located about an hour north of San Francisco. Woodsboro High was supposed to be played by Santa Rosa High School, but even though the school staff agreed to it, the school board shot it down. They didn't really want to glorify, um, violence against children. This isn't necessarily just a case of pearl clutching though. The city, which had a town hall meeting to discuss the school's use in the production, was still reeling from the case of Polly Kloss, a 12 year old from a nearby town who had recently been kidnapped and murdered. Craven said later on that Whoa. in retrospect, Jesus. he understood their concerns, but he was pretty pissed by the last minute pullout at the time. Thus the peculiarity at the end of the credits saying no thanks, no thanks whatsoever to whatsoever. the school. Whatsoever. Instead, the Jesus. high school was played by a community center in the nearby Sonoma. An hour into the film, we make our way there, folks. The party at 261 Turner Lane, that's, one of the- That's pretty understandable though, to be fair. Like this, I can see why the school did do that. Like they just had a crazy situation that's almost kind of close. It's pretty fair. Oh, shit, we DC'd again. Coolest third act locations for a horror film ever. We spend more than 40 minutes at Stu's space. Oh, my internet crashed, man. Vicious twisty farmhouse, all of which is shot on location at a house now known as the Spring Hill Estate. Located in Tamales, this spacious farmhouse sits on a hill super isolated from anything around it. In one of the top three coolest things we've ever done with dead meat, in November 2021... Oh yeah, they had like an Airbnb type thing. That was pretty cool. Chelsea and I were flown out to the Scream House and stayed there overnight. We were amazed at how much the action of the movie matched the house's real layout. We made a damn good video walking through what happens where. Make sure you check it out sometime. There's no better way to make a party lame though than the presence of a cop and a reporter. Dewey's here to play protector, but Gail's guile gets her into the party with him. You're underage, son. I'm kidding. <laughs> Have a good time. Driving. There, she plants a camera pointed at a bunch of drunk teenagers. Gail, you were just asking for legal troubles. Later, she learns her teen feed has a 30 second delay, like she were living in the post Nipplegate world. Speaking of nips, Tatum heads 30. to the garage to re up her boyfriend on brewskis. While she's in there, delay. a ghost face appears, ready to do his best David Byrne. Oh, you want to play Psycho Killer? 
things start getting serious. Enough for a party foul. And after the steel gets broken out, Tatum has no choice but to fight back. Yeah, Ghostface, you are the Rexus. sloppiest match. She's straight you, man. You're suck covered up. in beer. <laughs> You're doing clown stunts and shit. Uh, Ghostface gets the last laugh when Dude, Tatum tries to crawl out through a cat up. door while incorrect. Oh, that had to be Stu, surely. Correctly estimating her bust. She's stuck as the killer turns on the world's strongest garage door motor and oh, killed when she's crushed kill. against the roof of the garage. Even Ghostface is like, wow, that really worked? <laughs> this memorable kill was a bit difficult to do. They had to nail Rose McGowan to the inside of the garage door so she wouldn't fall out. She clearly fits through it most of the time. They used a fake body for the ultimate crushing shot, which had to be cut from the theatrical release. The MPAA Aww. kept threatening to give Scream oh, a an MC-17. Craven and editor Patrick Lussier had to recut and resubmit it nine times in order to get the R rating. The party clears out Damn. as the trash is brought in. Different Billy times. Loomis, looking as greasy as ever. Bro, that would pass by so easy, I would think. Oh yeah, for sure. I've seen some, oh bro, Terrifier exists. Yeah, that shit would have passed so easy, <laughs> but like, damn, that's crazy. Even at the time, it didn't pass. That was wild. Stu offers them his parents' bedroom. It didn't seem that bad. Bedroom, and Sid takes him up on the opportunity. She apologizes to Billy for her chastity, saying she was afraid of becoming like her mother. I always forget how much Maureen Prescott's promiscuity is mentioned in this movie. Well, nothing like talking about your mom's sex life to get you in the mood. Sydney finally goes to Pound Town with Billy, which is not what you're supposed to do if you're in a horror movie, according to Randy downstairs. He interrupts a viewing of True. Halloween to go over the rules of surviving a horror film. Don't no sex up. is number one, followed by no drugs or alcohol. And finally, you can never say I'll be right back. Because <laughs> you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Gail's not into this meta shit, so she leaves with Dewey. He's checking out a car reported on the side of the road. The party dies down more, and the last guests leave after they hear that Principal Hembry's body is hanging from the school's flagpole. In fact, this is why Hembry was killed in the first place. It was a late addition to the script, done solely to clear out the last of the party extras. On their way out, oh, the teens drive Dewey and Gail from the side of the road, and closer together. Ooh, these two about to be horizontally dancing in the dark. The romance is cut short mm -hmm. when they find the reported car. Owned by Sydney's still missing father. Everybody's a suspect! Sydney and Billy are debriefing right. from their bone sesh when her suspicions start to match how her body felt a few minutes ago. Aroused. They're quelled when Ghostface appears in the ghost flesh and flays Billy's torso with a knife. He calls out for Sid, then collapses, kicking off an elaborate chase scene through the house. Awesome chase scenes are a staple of Scream movies, and this one starts that motif off strong. Again, check out the video we did to see how much it follows the place's real layout. Sydney winds up falling backwards onto a big old boat mattress, and the sight of Tatum's corpse sends her fleeing from the farmhouse. She takes refuge inside the news van with Gail's intrepid cameraman Kenny. Kenny's been around the entire film, just getting abused by Gail. He's played by prolific <laughs> right. character actor W. Earl Brown, who also played a morgue attendant in Wes Craven's new <laughs> I like the Dude put on 20 pounds. I like the spoof Kenny. Where he's he's in like scary movie and he steps on Gail's shoe and I, that was motherfucking funny. Sounds to play Kenny since the script had Gail berating him with fat jokes. Ghostface nearly murders Randy Meeks. Oh damn, he had to gain. Oh shit, he had to gain like twenty pounds. Wes Craven's new nightmare. Dude put on twenty pounds damn. to play Kenny since the script had Gail berating him with fat jokes. Ghostface nearly murders Randy Meeks, who's talking to Jamie Lee Curtis on the TV. It becomes meta when applied to his own actor, Jamie Kennedy. Behind you, behind Jamie, Jamie, turn around. This is one of the only shots where Ghostface around, isn't Jamie. played by a stunt performer. Another is a shot in the opening scene. Director Craven wears the masks when Casey hits him with the phone, dick! Otherwise, <laughs> Ghostface was primarily played phone, by three dick. stunt performers. <laughs> Dane Farwell seems to have done most of the work in chase scenes and had the idea of wiping off the bloody blade after stabs to avoid continuity errors. Bro, the Lee performance played Ghostface Stu gives at the here in a second, man. So he did the opening scene and the attack on Principal Hembry. Finally, stunt coordinator Tony Cesari played Ghostface for the next kill that's about to happen. Cesari was previously on the kill count, doing that amazing fire stunt in the original Nightmare. God, that thing rules. Okay. Sid and Kenny watch as Ghostface lingers over Randy, but due to the delay, Ghostface is already at the van and murders Kenny with a throat slit. Brown's the look delay. of shock was so oh, convincing, no. the MPAA demanded it be cut from the theatrical version. Sydney leaves the dead wood behind her and pieces out through the van's escape tunnel, which is not scaled for Ghostface eyes. Dewey and Gale get back, <laughs> and while Dewey investigates the now-empty house, Gale finds evidence of ne'er-do-well 
yelling. Randy pops up and she hits him with the phone, dick! Then finds out <laughs> Kenny's body phone, is on the roof dick. of the van. Stuck up there something good, too. She has to Tokyo drift it off. That and a flailing Sydney in the road causes Gail to crash the van against a tree. Uh, did I do that? Sydney gets back to the house to see Dewdrop stumble out with a knife in his back. Ghostface retrieves his weapon and continues Man, to chase always into another vehicle. God damn, dude, you two have been going at it for so Dewey long. It's like, the will end. they, won't they already, right? All this running around was taxing as hell. The whole last act, everything at Stu's house, was a single scene in the script that took 21 nights to shoot at the end of production. When we finished damn. it, we 21. had t-shirts made. I survived scene 118. Sydney can't trust anyone anymore, what with Randy and Stu both accusing the other of being the killer. Everybody's a suspect! She curses them both as she locks them outside. Billy stumbles out of the bedroom upstairs and... <laughs> All the way down the stairs. Good job, bro. He takes the gun from Sydney and lets Randy back inside so he can show off his best psycho impression. We all go a little mad sometimes. With that, he shoots Randy and reveals himself as the killer. It was Skeet Ulrich wearing the ghost face suit behind Randy a few minutes ago. Billy reveals that all his blood is just corn syrup and that the stabbing was faked. And who was his accomplice ghost face for that ruse? Surprise, Sydney. Yeah, but was it really a surprise? I mean, let's be real. Billy and Stu have looked like murderers in pretty much every scene they're in. Look at that knowing glance. But uh, to be fair, Stu, as a kid, Stu surprised me. But the other guy, no. Not at all. <laughs> Not even a little bit. I was kind of surprised by this too, though. Fair. It's easy to say this in hindsight. But it's also because it was like Matthew Lillard. I remember at the time I was like, it can't be Scooby-Doo or it can't be Shaggy. <laughs> like, I literally can't remember no a time I didn't know it was them. With the killers revealed, we get a full five minutes in hell as Sydney is tormented by these two, who clearly love each other, by the way. Or at least Stu loves Billy. That's probably unrequited. They reveal that they're the ones who murdered Sydney's mom a year ago, then framed that guy Cotton Weary. It was fun. While frivolity may have been Stu's only motive, the scene gets more deranged as Billy reveals his. He says his father had been having an affair with Sydney's mother. She's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. Skeet Ulrich's seriousness is perfectly balanced by Matthew Lillard's camp. Lillard's playing everything as loud as possible, fucking spitting oh, all over the place. There's Some more. people think it's annoying, but I think it's art. It's a scream, baby! Hold on a second. I think it's sick. Be right back. It's pretty extra, but fuck it. Even Lillard has it, his doubts sometimes. It's great. Go back and watch that. Like, first of all, I weigh 80 pounds. Second of all, I spit hmm. my way through the whole thing. He comes back with Sydney's father, who they're gonna frame for these murders. But first, they've gotta seem like they're survivors, so they play a round of stomach stabs. It's really the best way to build a friendship. Wow, Billy really wants to be Stu's friend, huh? All that bro love is making Stu feel light at it. I feel a woozy, <laughs> yeah! Gail shows up with a gun, having made her way back to the house from the accident. But the safety's on, so Billy simply kicks her against a pillar, knocking her down for a little do nap. Before he shoots her dead, they realize Sydney's gotten away. She calls with the voice changer to taunt them, and it angers Billy so much he forgets how to hang up properly. Fucking hit me with the phone, dick! <laughs> KB effects used over 50 gallons of fake blood for Scream, a lot of which was used in this finale. It's actually what led to that line. These little improv moments came out of because he hit me with the phone. You know, it slipped out of his hands because it was bloody. Whether written or mm. improvised, this mm. scene is full of Lillard lines that I honestly quote to fucking death. Oh, this one starts crying. <laughs> Five Sydney months. emerges from the closet to <laughs> oh, stab shit. Billy with an umbrella. <laughs> that, that scream so from good. Orange is real. Nev Campbell or I the stunt wish performer she, missed the- I always wish he came back, man. I always like some Matthew Lillard, man. It's so good. Protective vest he was wearing and accidentally actually stabbed him. <laughs> Stu tags in, but after a tussle over the couch, Sydney breaks a vase over his head and dumps a TV on him. It Daniel fries him to death. Zoinks! I'm gonna go ahead and count him here, Ooh, even though boys. Stu's survival has long been up for discussion. He returned in an early draft of Scream 3, and Lillard has said he'd love to return for Scream 6, which comes out in just a few months. I wish. I <laughs> tell, tell the people that make these decisions, I'm available. But if he's alive in that movie, I don't want any of you future fucks leaving comments saying I got it wrong, okay? I work with what I know. Sydney finds out that Randy's still Fair. alive, and Randy's face finds out that Billy's fist is still alive. Sid fingers his wound, <laughs> and he's shot down by Gale, but space Randy warns them out. not to get too comfortable. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life. 
for one last scare. Sure enough, Billy does, but Sydney puts a bullet in his head. She's just a badass like that. All right, who's still living after everything? Sid's dad? Okay, that's cool. Deputy Dewey? All right, even better. Especially since that wasn't always the case. When we shot the final scene, so I came out on the set killed him. and I was dead. And then Wes did a second take and he said, you know what, just kind of give a nod or something. This shows that you're still alive. It was a last minute idea from Craven to keep Dewey alive. And man, am I glad he did. Love my little doo-doo. The sun sure. begins to rise as emergency vehicles arrive. Dude, dude, the movie ends with Mel Weathers giving a first-hand <laughs> report on the Woodsboro murder. Brother just gave him some random ass pet name. We called him "I Love My Little Doo Doo Kachu." I'm glad he did. Love my little Doo Doo Kachu. The sun begins <laughs> right. to rise as emergency vehicles. He do be pretty great though. He comes in pretty clutch on the fourth one. I think it is. He has some pretty good moments there. Drive, and the movie ends with Gail Weathers giving a first-hand report on the Woodsboro murders. How many horror characters should have seen their deaths coming? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, you can just stay right there, though. I'll be right back! <laughs> I'll be right back. There were seven dead. kills in Scream, a solid single-digit start for the series. The victims consisted of five men and two women, so a more than two-to-one ratio of dudes. This count and gender breakdown was only seen once before in that Boy Meets World episode I covered. Remember that? Good times. Boy Meets World. With a runtime of 111 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 15.86 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Casey Becker. Lots of great kills oh, in this shit. movie, but I've got to I thought it was going to go to the dog to door. scarred me as a child. The almost machete for lamest kill Fair. will go to Principal Hembry. It's not very good. It doesn't even make me want to say, hey. And that's it. Scream came out five days before Christmas in 1996. It didn't have a great opening, but it actually made more money in its subsequent weekends, which is rare. Great word of mouth kept it in theaters for 31 weeks, all the way Damn. to May. It grossed more than $100 million and ensured a speedy sequel the next 31. year. I'll look at that next 31 week, weeks. until then, I'm James A. This has been The Kill Count. 31 weeks is absolutely crazy. Absolutely good in movie, though. It was a fun movie.